Today is August 30th. Welcome to Native Calgarian. Oki, Nagana go, Mako Chase Chase to Komaki. My name is Red Thunder One. My married English name is Michelle Robinson, and I use she and her pronouns. Native Calgarian is being recorded on the lands of the Nitsitapi, which is the Blackfoot Confederacy. The south foot, south of the imposed U.S. Canadian border, are the Blackfeet, and north of the border are the Siksika, Gunai, and Bagani of the Confederacy. These lands are uh, Treaty 7, signed September 22, 1877, with signatures that include Blackfoot Confederacy, the Stony Nakoda, the Wesley Chiniki Bearspaw Nations, the Dene from Sutina Nation, and I acknowledge all First Nation, Métis, Inuit, status and non-status across Turtle Island as the keepers of these lands. All non-Indigenous are treaty partners with the government signing on your behalf. I honor the Blackfoot as the elders and members have been so kind to me in my red journey, my red road journey. Um, Elder Red Crane taught me how to pronounce my spirit name. I was born in Calgary or in Blackfoot Mokinstis as Michelle Elliott, an English name which has afforded me privilege in an English colonial world. My mother is Northern Slavey Dene or Satu Dene, but my Indian Act and Post Status Card by the Canadian government says Yellow Knives Dene. My father is so Canadian, I am a daughter of the Mayflower and a daughter of the American Revolution while having an Indian Act and Post Status Card. I acknowledge my Dene lineage and that I was born in Calgary, but my family is not part of the Treaty 7 signatories. My Dene lineage roots me in the land of the Hare people, also called the Great Bear Lake people in Treaty 11. I'm a native to Turtle Island and my Dene nation is a visitor to this area of Klinsho Tine Indehe. In my language, Satu Dene, meaning many horse town, named after the Calgary Stampede. Land acknowledgements are critical for creating a safer space for Indigenous, as well as honoring the host as a guest and acknowledging your role as a treaty partner. My humblest apologies to the Blackfoot elders and language keepers as I try to learn the proper pronunciation. Any mistakes or misinterpretations will be on me. <clears throat> I encourage questions so that misunderstandings can be cleared up as soon as possible. I do not speak on behalf of all Indigenous, but I share what I share as I walk down my red road. If you're experiencing emotional distress after anything we talked about today and want to talk, call the First Nation and Inuit Hope for Wellness Helpline at 1-855-242-3310. It's toll free and open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Non-Indigenous, there are distress lines in your area as well. My Patreon account, is Native Calgarian, where you can pledge and support. Thank you to previous donors for already showing your support to our show. If you value listening and can afford to give, thank you. To those that cannot afford to give but listen in, I'd love to hear from you at nativeyyc at gmail.com. Send me your comments, your questions. I also have a YouTube channel and would love to have you subscribe. For podcasts, we are on Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher. I have to give a shout out to my super loyal donors, Adam, Alexandria, Beatrice, Ben, Beth, Brian, Kat, Celine, Christina, Crystal, Diana, Jana, Jenny, Jocelyn, Judy, Karen, Kathy, Kenna, Leah, Lisi, Marcy, or Marisa, Melissa, Morami, Natalie, Nathan, Rebecca, The Sprawl, Shara, Sharon, Tammy, Tiffany, Vanessa, and Veronica. <laughs> so today I'm really honored to have AJ with me. <clears throat> AJ, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, for sure. So, Danse, Magwich Manitan at Sigasun, Nahil Napio Nia. Hello, my name is Grateful Spirit, my Korean name given to me uh, at the foot of the Three Sisters in the Rocky Mountains. I am a Korean man. Uh, my name is AJ, I go by AJ. Um, I come from Muskwichis, Samson Cree Nation. Um, I'm a father of twins and a brother to nine other siblings, so I'm pretty busy most of the time. Um, yeah, it's pretty basic, I understand, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. And I see you're an Oilers fan. Oh, yes, Oilers all the way since I was a young one. Yeah. I, I don't know. All the natives love the Oilers. I don't know. But I'm in Calgary, so obviously I love Calgary Flames. But um, I'm also old, and I remember when there was the big cup run, and the 80s were like amazing when it came to hockey. And, you know, it was easy to love Wayne Gretzky and all of the winners from that side. But from my side, we were always the underdog. So <laughs> that's fair. That's fair. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So 
AJ, you know, I, um, <clears throat> I got to know you a bit because during these new Black Lives Matter, Matter marches that have been happening and the t this talk about racism that's been happening in the last couple of months, you became kind of a prominent uh, person that was talking about it in the Red Deer area or Central Alberta area. And, um, you know, I'm an old person getting on TikTok and I noticed you have a huge TikTok following. So tell me a little bit about why you do activism and what messages you're trying to get out there. Yes, for sure. So um, my activism actually started back uh, close to the end of Idle No More. Well, with Idle No More, I should say. Um, I didn't know much. I was really young, but I was very um, empowered by seeing indigenous people standing up and fighting for equality, equity, and, and racism. So I must have been 19. Um, so I watched it. I was like, this is amazing. Like, okay, I can't wait to do more. Like, I want to, I want to do marches in Wetaskiwin. I was in Wetaskiwin. I want to do marches in Wetaskiwin and go march from Muskogee back to Wetaskiwin. I had all these grand ideas. Um, unfortunately, life happened and I kind of walk, I had to walk away for a little bit. But then I moved here to Red Deer in 2015 for college. And I could still, I, I knew racism because I grew up, um, I'm sorry, I don't know where to start. <laughs> but yeah, it's no. Really so but there's like, in my head, there are things going to my head. I'm like, oh, there's a lot of reasons why I do activism. Yeah, uh, and you can list them all. I mean, you know, I, I talk, and you'll hear it after, where I talk about all of the days, like, we deal with violence against Indigenous every single yes. day of our life. And, you know, that's kind of the importance of having wonderful guests like yourself on, is that we can you know, really show people like, you know, you think you're not racist, but you're racist. <laughs> <laughs> so true. So true. The common phrase is here every day. <laughs> so I guess we'll start at the very beginning then. Uh, I grew up in foster care. I was taken from my, uh, from my mother at eight months old, my twin sister, uh, bounced around between homes. Um, I ended up in a foster home out in, uh, it's very, it's a small town of 300 white people. And my foster parent was very racist, very racist and abusive. And I spent my uh, first 13 years of my life there. So it, racism and abuse was a daily thing for me. And uh, when I finally left, I had to learn how to uh, be sociable, you know, be okay with crowds and be okay with people and learn how to live as a human being, basically. Um, teenage years, I was in a, dark, in a dark place, deep in addictions, very lost, very confused. I didn't know where to go, what to do, what my purpose was. And I just wandered around most of central Alberta and up until around maybe 20, I was in BC as well. So I got to see all forms of racism. No matter where I went, no matter what town I went to, there's always people like, oh, it's a dirty Indian. It's a drunk Indian. And just stares and glares and people just being so nasty you're just like why and I, I remember now clearly why i bounced around because i didn't want to stay too long in one place because once i saw there was hatred there i would move just because like, i don't want to deal with this i have enough stuff on my plate per se um i started finding my real purpose when i don't more i don't know more exploded um i saw that people were standing up and saying enough and I wanted to be a part of that as i was saying earlier <laughs> before i got flustered um <laughs> uh i wanted to do things like that and fight back and raise my voice and use it to, to help or bring up change if, if it's possible at all. It was a hope and a dream. Um, as I had said, uh, life had happened again and I had to back away. Um, my friend actually told me to go to college to try to get education to become a social worker because I told him my story and he was amazed and horrified about what I, what I had gone through, the abuses, the racism, and just how awful it had been, he said. You could help someone else and being a social worker is a great field for you because you can listen and understand people so, okay great idea so 2015 went in i uh, moved to red deer went to rdc red deer college um while there i met an elder here in red deer who at first he was very terrifying he's a big dude i was like i don't want to talk to him like, i know who talk. you're talking about <laughs> <laughs> i was like oh no so i remember walking up, i was like hi he's like well, hello there, young man. I'm like, whoa, <laughs> not what I expected. He, he took me in and he started mentoring me. He's still my mentor to this day. Mm -hmm. um, so, hmm, sorry? That's great. I'd, I'd love him to pieces. And I know who you're talking about because um, I went up there for, there was a hoop 
with uh, 100 feathers. And um, it's through yeah. what, yeah, you were there. We, so we met only, we didn't know, know each other. <laughs> we didn't know that. <laughs> so this world works, eh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's where I first met him and I friended him on Facebook, but uh, you know, through the course, we haven't really interacted. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, I, I try to stay on top of what's going on down in red or up in Red Deer, but um, I mean, sometimes you just can't do it all. And so I was really like, blown away by all of the work I'm seeing in the anti-racism stuff but I don't want to go there until we're ready to kind of um you know continue the conversation of what it was like being at the RDC and having this elder who kind of take you under your wing yes of course so uh he's the one that started teaching me about actually like guiding me on how I might be our people used to live like our traditions our lessons and our teachings so he helped me find my identity as a Cree man before and I didn't know it. I was just your nobody. I well, I was just existing. <laughs> I was AJ. <laughs> so he taught me and showed me what to do. Um, he started asking me to uh, start standing with him in marches. So like in ceremonies, carrying a flag or carrying something. Um, particularly too because um, I'm an ex-cadet of seven years, an armed cadet. So I know military uh, drill and he's he's a ex-soldier too, as I believe. So we bonded that way too as well. So um, we started, when the truth reconciliation happened here in our, our, our Red Deer, um, he really tried to, or he really worked on educating me on what that meant and but what the rights are as indigenous people on this land and now Canada needs to work with us and stuff like that. So there's an incident that came up about housing for like funding for indigenous housing and for supports here in Red Deer, there was an incident and we started to march. And this has been, that's probably my first march ever. So I was pretty nervous. I was like, oh no, what if I get arrested? I'm so scared. I don't want to do this. But he's like, carry that flag with pride and raise your voice. Don't be afraid. Like, I know it's it's nerving and it's awkward, but just just don't, you're with, you're with your people. You're okay. Yeah. So I have pictures of that actually, of me marching to City Hall from the Red Deer Native Friendship Center and chanting and people drumming and, you know, it was the most powerful thing. And I remember feeling a wave of such pride and feeling such strength that it became kind of like a obsession because I was like, yes, <laughs> this is great. I can actually use my voice for the right reasons and I can, you know, hopefully learn to, as I now, I can shout with like, releasing all that energy. Back then, I was kind of like a little kitten, like <laughs> very quiet. So um, that was when we first, I first started my protesting and being an activist. And with uh, my friend's help, we st I started being more, um, more out there. So when uh, the incident in North Dakota happened, no DEPL, uh, we stood here up in Red Deer in solidarity. And once again, I was part of that. And I was driven. And we marched, even in the dead of winter, when it was like, I think like minus 25, mm -hmm. we still marched. And we're like, water is life, you know, stay off their land. <laughs> what are you doing, basically? And yeah, that was another step on my activism role. Um, as time went on, you know, going back home after the protest and whatnot, still looking around and going like, wow, nothing's really changed at all. Mm -hmm. Like people, even when we were doing new, no, no dapple, people with trucks were gassing us, revving their engines, and just being a negative thing. And, Still to this day, it still kind of affects me, but not as much. Back then, I was like, oh, God, I just want to disappear into the mist again and not come back out because I don't want to go through more stuff than my rainbow. I go through daily life, you know, with uh, the slurs and the um, microaggressions, stuff like that. So, yeah. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it sucks. And um, so I'm a newer to TikTok, and I posted uh, a march that we did yesterday. Mm -hmm. And uh, so my Twitter and my Facebook, I have an extensive like tens of thousands of blocked people, but um, I'm newer to TikTok. So the trolls know which, hitch, which, which hashtag to look to and are there. So I got to look later today and try to start blocking some more folks. But I noticed that when somebody else likes a, a slur, or a negative comment in general like you can't really know who they are yet so i got to figure out that so i know how to start protecting myself from those types of people and comments and because i'm about creating a safer space 
for Indigenous yeah. to be proud who they are. And I see a lot of our Indigenous folks make TikToks being like, can you believe people said this to me? And I'm like, uh, yep, yeah, I, I can. And um, yeah, it sucks. <laughs> it does. Yeah. The, yeah, that's interesting. You know, TikTok. Actually, for my TikTok account, I was actually surprised because when we marched here in Red Deer, the first protest ever when at the death of George Floyd, I made a TikTok explaining, like, I am a father of twins. And there's a TikTok video of me with my daughter. And the sign, first ever first ever sign I ever carried was a sign that said, well, my twins lose their father too. That was the first sign I had made, and I marched with that. And in this video, I'm holding my daughter, and I'm, I'm very emotionally charged in this video. Like, I'm very sad, very afraid, very just vulnerable. And my daughter's just smiling in my arms, and she's like, play with my hair, play with the sign. And then uh, I flip the sign up, and for, for like a, a couple of seconds, it's up there. And then my daughter rips it out of my hand, almost like, not going to happen. Mm. So uh, that was the first video that got a lot of attention because people were like, oh, wow. They're like, uh, Jesus. Because <laughs> yeah. it's raw in your face, right? And I, I prefer when I do my videos to be raw and to not like, doll it up in a way you know and be fake so yeah I, I don't know how to do all that stuff yet so even if I wanted to be that cool person I have <laughs> right on my TikTok cringy over 40 mom so that everybody <laughs> knows you're not gonna get cool stuff from me I'm just an old lady who's like damn I gotta be on TikTok now <laughs> right, yeah uh, it's uh um yeah it's true it's very there's one thing I, I, I was thinking about even when you were talking about like trolls I believe on my TikTok followers, they actually go through my comments list and get rid of those messages before I even see them. Oh. Because very few people have uh, been trolls. And then when they do, people jump on them and are like, excuse me. Like, I, I get a lot of stuff from the States because a lot of my followers are from the States. And right now with the BLM and how things are going, there's a lot of people going like, why are you a Biden supporter? Or why are you BLM? Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, yeah, first of all, I'm Canadian. And I usually stop some of their tracks. They're like, oh, crap. <laughs> I'm just like, yeah, I'm Canadian. I'm Plains Cree. I'm fighting for my people up here in Canada, Alberta specifically. And they're like, oh, and then they just disappear. And another tactic I do as well is I ignore the the comments. I don't give them a platform. I just go like, I'm like, okay, cool. Delete. Have a nice yeah. day. That's oh, you can delete them? That, that, oh. I got to do that because usually I just block people. So I'll look again and try to delete and block. So, yeah, so just hold the comment thing and you'll get options pop up. Oh, okay. still, yeah delete them yeah but sometimes i like to i kind of i can be petty sometimes sometimes i'm just like okay this person's clearly not he's very uneducated clearly and <laughs> they're still like, this, right? it's very atrocious i, I kind of let people like kind of do their things so i'm like eh you know but usually i just delete them and i just ignore them because i don't have time to explain to you because obviously you're not going to listen and you're stuck in your ways so why waste yeah. the effort you know, um, to go back to what you were saying about um, uh, being an ex-cadet. So mm. I grew up in Sylvan Lake, actually. And um, in, the, in those days, so this would have been 89 to 92-ish, there was a, a, a bus that would come from a, a, C, a military base in Penhold. And would pick up the kids in Penhold. It would stop in um, Innisfail. It would pick up a few farm kids stop in Sylvan Lake, and then we go off to the Red Deer Armory. So I was a sea cadet. Okay. And I was a sea cadet because there was transportation. And yeah. um, really, honestly, and, it, and in Sylvan Lake at that time, there was nothing to do except, like, there was a hockey school for boys. And it was a really, like, you know, uh, toxic male environment. There was nothing for, for girls. So yeah. um, anyway, I hopped on this bus because my friend told me to. And off I went and I, I became a, a sea cadet and we had a sea cadet reunion last night on zoom and <laughs> my so one of my ex-boyfriends he um he's a Christian conservative firefighter and he oh. wants me on his podcast this afternoon because he said you know I want to have an intelligent conversation even though we are diametrically opposed to everything we believe in mm -hmm. and I'm like you know um, it, it could be fun I don't know like it's not like a regular troll that doesn't really have any personal investment right so um so it, it could be interesting so if i share it it'll be interesting but if i don't then I, I, maybe it won't even happen maybe we'll start talking and 
decide that this was a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, that sounds interesting, actually. Yeah, it's, I wonder how that's going to Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, and that well, and then Chrétien had his cuts. So my understanding is that they cut the bus and they cut a lot of that. So um, like, I, and I know like the camps that I went to were gradually being cut anyway. <clears throat> so when I took gunnery instructor, it was only a six week course. And um, now I hear, like, I don't even know if it exists actually for that matter. Um, and one of the other sailing camps is like completely gone from Gimli. So, um, you know, I know that there were a lot of cuts, but it was really influential in my life being a sea cadet and being a cadet in general. So I understand that bond. And, um, and here we are years later still having reunions. And one of our, um, the, one of the people we were with, she's actually a commanding officer of one of the naval ships now, and she was on leave. So it was really the impetus to have that Zoom meeting was to talk to her and see how she was doing, but she has to go back to Halifax now. So, mm. Yep. <clears throat> uh, you yeah. make strong bonds through cadets. What's that? You make, you make strong bonds through cadets. You do, and and it's uh, it's interesting because then you can relate to a lot of folks when they the way they talk, the way they are. Um, you know, I can always tell when somebody um, talks in you know o eight hundred as opposed to eight p eight a.m. because. <laughs> You know, I know they have some type of military influence in their background because no one talks like that except those t types of people, right? So, oh, yeah. yeah. And I learned skills. Like, I, I know it sounds stupid, but whenever I'm camping, I'm the only one who can tie a knot and properly enough to keep a tarp up or whatever, right? So, yeah. you know, um, things like that. So it, it was really practical. And then um, in those days when I was taking him, we still had like live ammo. So it was a small bore rifle instructor and we had um, a lot of fun just shooting off guns. And it, I thought it was a really valuable lesson to know how to disarm a firearm. And I'm a big proponent for that now, especially for indigenous women. Everyone should know how to disarm a firearm. And I mean, I have met the most, like I, I actually feel embarrassed for women that are so scared of a gun that they won't even touch it. Um, that, that just, and it bothers me because like they can literally die from this and they won't even touch it. So. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's something that that I feel really strongly about is that everyone should have their um, license so that they can pick up a gun and know how to disarm it and make sure that they're safe. But yeah. I, I wouldn't have learned that if it wasn't for sea cadets. So true. I was an army cadet, so I learned how to do the same thing. We used uh, first we were taught with the Daisy rifle, so the BB gun, and then the twenty two, and then when you were a master corporal, because I was uh, um, armored reconnaissance first, so master corporal. Uh, we learned we learned to use the Canadian Armed Forces standard rifle, so the C7. Um, yeah. uh, we learned how to load it, clean it, uh, take it apart, put it back together, and it was to this day I, I can still remember the movements with my hands. Like I can see a rifle and go, okay, so this has been correct. This needs to be fixed. Your fingers should not be on the trigger, <laughs> like in movies yeah. and stuff like that. Like I just oh my god, <laughs> doesn't it bother you watching these Black Lives Matter um, like fucking morons? Part of my language from the states who like they they but are white people who hate black people so they have these guns and the way they hold their guns and I'm like you guys are idiots you can't <laughs> even hold your rifle properly exactly there's no training it's just a bunch of boys with toys trying to be tough and it's like oh god can you just go back home and put that thing away <laughs> No, really, they're so unsafe, and and it is shocking to me that more black people don't die. Well, uh, it's shocking to me more white people don't die from them shooting themselves because they the way they they I've seen this one guy. There was like this row of I don't know a dozen white people. Yeah. They were all along the fence, and they were holding their guns like they were cradling it. But a uh, one there was a woman beside her husband, and I'm like, you fucking idiot! He could shoot you, just playing with his stupid gun. With, because right? they have no safety they have no safety in the states i i don't understand how they can just <laughs> give out these guns and yeah. have no safety training whatsoever on how to handle these guns mm -hmm. it's insane i wow <laughs> yeah i have to like i don't watch um the white protesters like they're anti anti uh, like, against us i don't watch them anymore because i'm like i the, the stupidity <laughs> Oh yeah, no, it, and it's hard, and that's what I mean about blocking trolls too. They're so pointless. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. So, 
Well, that I'm, I'm really glad that you're, you're doing all of that work. Um, so do you want to tell us all about, uh, it, what is it called? Is it anti-racist red deer or what's the full name? So I am a co-founder of the group called Black and Indigenous Alliance of Alberta. Uh, I work with two uh, black allies. So as you can tell, we've created a united front. Um, we were in Calgary yesterday. I myself was there working in security. Um, I'm that guy in the camouflage pants. <laughs> People were like, ooh. Some were like, oh my God, I'm scared. It's a militant. I'm like, okay, no, go away. Uh, but, Army Cadet, I, I, can, I can smell you all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> oh man. So what we do is um I have been working with uh, two I don't know if I can give their names out just because uh our group is still new and whatnot. Sure. But we have gone to Watasquin every Tuesday for the last four or for about a month now to march there and to raise awareness about uh anti racism, like from fighting back to end it, to change the policies that the uh the city has and to bring about equality and equity for the indigenous population that is there. Mm -hmm. there's, a there's a lot of indigenous people in Wetaskiwin just because it's um, 50 minutes away from Musquatchies, which is the reservation I come from. And people go to Wetaskiwin to get like food and water and they live there and they go to school there and whatnot. But the citizens of Wetaskiwin, those like the white people are very, very racist, <laughs> very mean, very cruel. Uh, if you, when you go to the Walmart there, you know, they have people like, they have telling their workers, like, watch out for Native people. They steal from the store, you know, profiling and following them. The cops are especially brutal, the RCMP. There's an incident with a friend of mine who, his brother-in-law was in the RCMP detachment when he was arrested. Um, he was there overnight, next morning. She went to pick him up, and they had to call a paramedic, or the medics to come and check him out, because apparently he had broken his hip in the jail cell. So... They arrived, which is this is just what I've been told. They arrived, looked over him. He has a hairline fracture on his leg, on his sort on his hip, and he can't move. He's pretty much incapacitated right now, and police have given no explanation, no reason, as usual. And this is this is like a occurrence that happens all the time up there. They're just racist police, mm -hmm. and that's why I'm pushing for defund the police as well because yeah. these are just boys that are just undertrained, under like over equipped. Um, they're given a badge and a gun and told to go do policing and watch out for the indigenous population. And they have free reign there. There's no accountability. No, so. there's never been accountability for the RCMP yeah. in Canada. And I, I have, um, like, well, I'm a part of the MMIW um, group here in Calgary. And one yeah. of our main women was a starlight tour where cops dropped her off and she froze to death. And, um, you know, her sister is here and they, they try to honor her um, every year. There's a rock in front of Grey Eagle Casino from the inquiry that's honor her. Um, <clears throat> and all of the, you know, policing stories that I hear, whether it's national or whether it's local, it's always police is somehow involved. Um, I'm in the neighborhood of Colton Crowshoe and um, he was with the police, uh, got the crap beaten out of him conveniently off uh, film and every like like they have all the film to prove it was the cops that did it and yet there's nothing that can be done and that and that just shows the injustice of the system and then conveniently he goes missing um they refused to look for him because it was at the start of stampede this was the same time those two grandparents and that grandchild were missing they were on the front of the calgary sun every single day this um police went down to mexico to try to investigate a possible connection, but they couldn't even mention Colton Crowshoe. So like, mm. I know how little we matter to our CMP and to Calgary police and, oh, yeah. um, and, it, and it's, it's hard because this is my, my community. How am I supposed to walk the streets knowing how, how we're gonna be treated and how if you know, I go missing, it won't be investigated equally as if I was white and that's, yeah, exactly. That's the worst part, right? So, yeah. so defunding the police is absolutely something that I have no problem with, and um, and I know damn well that they like they just don't care about women. Um, women don't report their rapes because they know that uh, they won't be believed. They'll be belittled, and it's traumatic even telling the cops. And it certainly doesn't go anywhere with Crown or or um, in the legal system because there's really no, you know, 
way to get that going if your barrier are racist, sexist cops. So yeah. I have zero respect for the police. Um, you know, I, I, I know a couple of police officers and obviously I love them very much. They're a part of my life. But um, like having a cop or two that you like is not the same as systemic racism, systemic exactly. sexism, you know, and that bigger picture. Right. And I, it's so, so gross. I can't even like go down there. So defunding the police is not, not a, not a question for me. It's the opposite that it's like, if we're going to save our people's lives. If we're going to save that boy from getting a hairline hip fracture, that's going to leave him damaged for life. Because as you know, we don't even get proper health care. So, oh, yeah. you know, you tell a, a doctor or a nurse that, yeah, he was in the jail and, and his hip broke. It's like, it's like that it gives them permission to treat us worse. So I, uh, I hate the system. There's nothing about the system that, that works for indigenous people. So that's, that's why true. when we were yelling, you know, fuck the system, I was like, fuck the system. <laughs> well, that's the first time I've ever used my voice and let my anger out finally against the police. I, I have harbored these feelings for such a long time. I've never had a safe way to release it, right? Yeah. So if I'd be able to say that, I'd be like, you know what? It's true. Yeah. It's very true. And the power from the group as well, from that march, it was just like, <laughs> people are done. People are fed up, especially here in Canada, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, hmm, things got to change, you know? And that's why we're marching in Wetaskiwin, and that's why now marching in Pinocchio now as well, you know? And I, I kind of, I really hope, or I really wish, like, soon that people would come join us in these cities, because especially Pinocchio, Pinocchio is disgustingly racist. It is one of the most disgusting places I've ever marched in with any protest group. Like with Calgary, it was not as bad as Pinocchio in my opinion. Because mm -hmm. at least in Calgary, you know, this big crowd, people are like, oh crap, I can't be open, be racist, because I'll get my ass kicked. And Pinocchio, it's like a good maybe 75% 70, of the, that's, uh, I guess you call it a town or a city, whatever it is, openly were racist, screaming at us, calling us an Antifa, calling us scum, communist, you know, fuck off, go home, go back, go back to your home or land or something like that. And I'm like, Jesus, I'm like, right now it's women and youth who are marching in Pinocchio and they're getting gassed out by boys in their trucks. You know, people are spinning their tires out and driving really close to them. And I'm like, so you're threatened by women and youth that you have to do this. Like, you're you're not a man you're a coward no they are and that, that's the irony about racists is that they are so so cowardly and yeah. um you know it, when we were i don't know if you know much about Tabor, but Tabor is uh just outside of lethbridge and it oh, um yeah. it, oh, holy shit is it homophobic um <laughs> holy shit so same kind of thing when we do the Tabor flag raising actually is that these trucks um, you know, constantly circle us and, um, you know, spin out and it's disgusting. And I just think like, so are you in the closet? Are you that insecure about your, your sexuality? Like, and I don't mean that in a derogatory way. Like I'm a, you know, like, even though I ran, I'm a liberal and that I always say I'm actually quite a conservative, you know, monogamous, um, yeah. person, a straight woman who's never, you know, really thought about much about expanding my, what healthy sexuality is. I just don't, but <clears throat> obviously oppressing somebody based off their sexuality is something that I have a lot of, you know, strong feelings about because I know what it's like to be oppressed simply because I exist as a native woman. So, <laughs> you know, um, yeah. And I, I just, I look at those, those boys with their trucks and I think you have more money for a truck and gas than you do brains. And, um, and it's just in Alberta here, like anyone with that's breathing and upright can get a job. And, uh, I mean, this is like the first time in, in our history that it's kind of not like that. So, um, anyway, 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 <laughs> I hear that. Yeah. yeah, well, thank you so, for being on my show. I'm going to go through my, um, what I, what I talk about here at the end here is just kind of, you know, solutions and such, because, mm -hmm. um, you know, we've been giving those solutions forever but yet everybody's so overwhelmed with racism oh my god I have no idea it just seems like such a big thing <laughs> so this is kind of what I give for solutions in the hopes that maybe <clears throat> they'll like you know pick up a book and read or something god right. forbid <laughs> so 
Indigenous have been talking about the issues, sharing our traumas in reports, commissions, and public hearings, just so it can be regularly disregarded. No more. Honor our words. Honor the treaties. Listen to politicians and their policies and platforms. If they don't recognize marginalized in their budget with Gender Equity Plus, if they're cutting violence prevention programs, services, Indigenous education, uterus health choices, gay straight alliances, lack of human rights for migrants, immigrants, folks with disabilities, know that your vote for that party directly negatively impacts marginalized people. Demand that they implement the Truth and Reconciliation Commission calls to action. The recommendations of the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples, the multiple reports about child welfare reform and violence prevention, and now 231 calls to justice from the National Inquiry on Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women, Girls, and Two-Spirit. Denying those reports is a form of abuse called gaslighting. Our people are experiencing extreme racism in the educational and health institutions with multiple reports that say the same thing. Demand change from the election platforms and politicians. If they don't understand colonialism, racism, privilege, sexism, they literally have zero business running. It should be understood by all parties or local politicians, community organizations, sports. A really great article I said out loud in episode 62 is Truth Before Truth, How Non-Indigenous Canadians Become Allies. You can Google it and find it and read it. I want to continue by putting cultural safety into action so that you can create a safer space for Indigenous, people of color, those with disabilities, and LGBTQ2 plus to speak. Look at it as first aid. First, you have to do something. Having good intentions is not enough. Pretending you don't see color is not good enough. You have to take action to make change. Speak out against racism. Ask questions of those with more understanding. Find allies and create a support system for yourself so that you can help advocate for culturally safe approaches. Take responsibility for your own learning. Read, reflect, ask questions. Do not expect this learning to come from Indigenous people. Take time for self-reflection. Be aware of your assumptions, your biases. Question everything you've learned about Indigenous people and take steps to actively disrupt those stereotypes. Commit to lifelong learning. Be prepared to be uncomfortable. Understanding colonialism and the legacy of racism is an ongoing and difficult task. And I want to say thank you to heretohelp.bc.ca on what is Indigenous cultural safety and why I should care about it for those links. <clears throat> Internalized racism or lateral violence is another form of Indigenous violence or well, marginalized people in general speak from the structure of oppression imposed on these lands from the Indian Act, Indian residential schools and other land clearing policies. <clears throat> Racialequitytools.org, what is internalized racism by Donna Bevins has some really good resources. Do's and don'ts for bystander intervention by the American Friends Service Committee. They have, if you witness public instances of racism, anti-Black, anti-Muslim, anti-trans, anti-Indigenous, or any form of oppressive interpersonal violence and harassment, use these tips on how to intervene. Do make your presence known. If possible, make eye contact with the person being harassed and ask them if they want support. Move yourself near the person being harassed, if possible, and you feel that you can do so without risk. Make a barrier between you and the person being harassed and the attacker. If it's safe to do so, begin recording or filming the incident. It's a lot easier to delete something later than it is to wish you had it on uh, record. Take cues from the person being harassed. Are they already engaging with the harasser? Do you want to make suggestions like, can, um, do you want to walk over here with me or can I walk over there with you? Can we move to another train car? Do you want for him to leave you alone? It's a really strong question. Follow their lead. Notice if the person being harassed is resisting in their own way and honor that. Especially white folks, don't tone police people being harassed. So if somebody is coming at me and I'm like, shut up you piece of shit, white supremacist. And people are like, oh, you shouldn't say that. Fuck off, that's tone policing and you don't need to do that. Notice if a person being harassed is resisting in their own way and honor that, especially white folks. Follow up with the individual being harassed when the incident is over and see if they need anything else. When it happens, it's embarrassing. I hate it. And it, you don't want to make a big deal out of it. But if you give somebody your card, it validates you witness the whole thing and then you have their back. And if they want to do something later, then they have that option of having a witness. So be that person. Be a good person. 
do what you have to do to keep you both safe. Assess your surroundings. Are there others nearby that you can pull in for support? Working as a team is a good idea if possible. And if it's possible, just move to a safer space. Do not call the police. For many communities experiencing harassment right now, the police can cause a greater danger for the person being harassed. This is in, in all of the information about domestic violence. Every woman who calls the police on their attacker, it ends up being worse. So that's why women don't report. Don't escalate the situation. The goal is to get the person being harassed to safety and not incite further in violence. And don't do nothing. Silence is violence. Silence is dangerous. It communicates approval and leaves the victim high and dry. If you find yourself too nervous or afraid to speak out, move closer to the person being harassed to communicate your support with your body and give them your damn card. Teach your kid about um, accountability in a positive way because these racists, these sexists, these homophobes are learning it from somewhere. If you're experiencing emotional distress and want to talk, call the First Nation and Inuit Hope for Wellness Helpline at 1-855-242-3310. It is toll free and open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Violence is my everyday reality. Every Indigenous generation has faced it. That's why I started this podcast to speak freely without interruption, without tone police, without leadership shaming, without gaslighting questions, as many people don't want to hear Indigenous opinion, but sure want to tell us theirs, usually by people who know nothing about us, know nothing about colonialism, uh, the constant surveillance of Indigenous people, our protests, our vigils, and our rights, mm -hmm. typical microaggressions, people dealing with internalized racism, who are gatekeepers that survive off the status quo, and who are so in their trauma, they stop people from doing the good work, and deplete personal resources. Internal and external racism is an everyday for Indigenous, everyday reality for Indigenous people, and that's why I needed this podcast to be heard. I want to say thank you to my ancestors, my granny, my mom of what strength looks like through your example. I want to thank my dad for teaching me to be strong and blunt, my stepmom for showing me what a proud culture is through her Austrian family roots and teaching me to be a proud Calgarian. It is through her that I am a second generation proud Calgarian. Thank you to my husband, Darcy, for producing and editing this show on top of being my husband, my lifelong friend, the father of our child, and my support down the journey of my red road. He has witnessed decades of sexism and racism. And to our child, who we are blessed to learn from every day, we are honored you chose us. You give me daily accountability to be a better and stronger person. And I hope my daughter and my family will be proud in the future of me trying to discuss these present day issues in a way that they can understand down the road. Again, my Patreon account is Native Calgarian, where you can pledge and support. Thank you, Adam, Alexandria, Beatrice, Ben, Beth, Brian, Kat, Celine, Chris, uh, Christina, Crystal, Diana, Jana, Jenny, Jocelyn, Judy, Karen, Kathy, Kenna, Leah, Lisi, Marisa, Melissa, Morami, Natalie, Nathan, Rebecca, The Sprawl, Shara, Sharon, Tammy, Tiffany, Vanessa, and Veronica. Thank you all for signing up. If you did one donation or had to do many or, or many and had to quit for financial reasons, please know I appreciated your support. If you value listening and can afford to give, thank you. To those who cannot afford to give but listen in, I'd love to hear from you at nativeyyc at gmail.com where you can send in your comments or questions. I also have a YouTube channel. I would love to have you subscribe. And we have Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher for those who listen on the, on the interwebs. <laughs> I want to end by giving a side eye to the Calgary rabbits. You're lucky I'm not your dish. And my beautiful cousin would respond, or you'd be in my dish. <laughs> <laughs> AJ, thanks for being on my show. You're very welcome. <laughs>